I am Shweta. I have over 16 years of experience in IT and software. So my name is Jeff Burke. I'm a senior cloud solutions architect at Sunari. My name is Alistair. I am a contract senior DevOps and platform engineer working for the UK government. My name is Victor. I work in Upbound with a company behind Crossplane. You should check it out. You will see it later actually as well. I have a Twitter account. I belong to some groups. I have books and the podcasts and YouTube. Boring, right? You're not here to hear about those things. What you are here is to hear about declarative infrastructure or infrastructure in general, right? Now, for me to explain where we are and where we're going, I need to go back in time. How we were doing things long time ago, right? Before we got declarative infrastructure, there were a couple of ways we could manage our stuff. Whatever the stuff is, doesn't matter whether it's a database, it's a cluster, it's a server, it's whatever it is. And one of the ways we were doing that is through consoles, right? Web UIs. You go somewhere, you click some buttons, you fill in some fields, you click more buttons, and then something happens and you get something, right? Now, that's a great way to get introduced to something. Let's say AWS, right? If you're new to AWS or Google Cloud or Azure or any other way to manage your infrastructure, Web UIs are great, but only and exclusively as a learning way to learn how something works. Using web is the most horrible way you can use or the most horrible way to approach managing it for real. So do it only for learning purposes. And by the way, post your questions. I want to see your questions, discussions, chat, anything, right? I like to be interrupted. So if you have any question at any time, let me know. I'll do my best to check it in the comments, right? Every few minutes. I will not wait until the end. What's your questions? Now, why console is a terrible idea? Well, there are many reasons. And one of them is that you cannot document what you did. How will your colleagues know what you did and how you did it? If you just go to some web page and click, then something happens, right? Are you going to take screenshots? Are you going to paste those screenshots into Wiki or something like that? Horrible idea, right? Very hard, if not impossible, to document what you did. And it's important to document what you did because you're not alone. There are other people in your companies that be able to find out what you did. Not as police, not because somebody is policing you, but because that's how teams work, right? It is very hard to reproduce something, right? Because what is the guarantee that if you want to get the same thing again, to get into the same state of something, you will click exactly the same buttons and fill in exactly the same fields and so on and so forth. How do you do that? By typing very slowly. No, that's a bad idea, right? How do you collaborate with your teammates? I already mentioned, not really happening, very hard. And finally, if you use console, it's very hard to keep up with the changes and the updates and the, which parts you should change and how you should change them. Bad idea, no serious team or company uses web console to manage their infrastructure. Actually, not infrastructure, anything. No serious team does that. Now, the alternative that we had since the dawn of time, since Linux emerged, is CLI, right? You can create a shell script and you can do something like this, right? You can execute a command like, for example, I want an EKS cluster, EKS, couple, cluster, create, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you get the cluster. That works. That's better than web UIs but it's still not good. It's actually still terrible, just slightly less terrible idea to create scripts and execute commands because there are quite a few obstacles there, right? First of all is, again, how do you document? How can you tell somebody, this is the state that I want? This is what I wanted to have, and this is what I have. You cannot do that through shell scripting. You can, but it's extremely hard. Second, it's not reproducible, again, because if you were to create shell scripts or any other type of scripts, you would need to have an infinite amount of if else statements. Hey, if I execute this script again, will it create a new cluster or a new database or will it update the cluster because it already exists and so on and so forth. Extremely hard. You cannot collaborate. 
still to shell scripts and you cannot keep with changes and updates again because that would mean that you would need to add infinite number of conditionals that would verify what you already have and then act accordingly. Now, there are a couple of other questions that are very hard to answer when working with either web consoles or shell scripts. To begin with, how do you know, and I already mentioned, what is the desired state? How do you specify what you want in the first place? Because when you say create cluster.sh, you know, because you want to execute the script, that's not a specification of what you want. So nobody knows what you want. Nobody can review it through a pull request or something like that. And on top of that, you do not know what you have, right? Because how do you find out what is the difference between what you want and what you have? And those two leads me to the drip detection, right? Drip detection is probably one of the most important features of any serious tool today that we use to manage anything, whatever that something is. Drip detection in a nutshell means, hey, this is what you told me you have, this is what you have, this is the diff, this is the delta. I should not touch the database, but I should modify subnets or whatever it is, right? To, uh, to accomplish, to remove that drift between those states. So we have drift detection and reconciliation close to impossible with web UIs or consoles. Now, in the meantime, and that was like, now when I'm speaking about shell scripting and stuff like that, I'm speaking about things that were happening maybe 20 years ago, something like that, before we got tools like CF Engine, which probably nobody remembers anymore. I do because I'm too old, but it's really 25, 20, 25 years ago. And since then, we do not do that, at least those of us taking our jobs seriously, right? Unless it is there for the practice, for learning experience or something. So the two main concepts, couple of main concepts I want you to memorize, because we are going to get to them, is, or phrases, desired state, what I want, what something should be, and the actual state, what something is. Those are the most important states or most important things you need to know when you're managing Anything, really. Drift, that's the, whenever I say drift from now on, that what I want to say is the difference between those two states. And when I say reconciliation, what I want to say is removal of that drift. Making those two states, the desired and the actual state, exactly the same. We call that reconciliation. What we need, as in what we've been doing for many years now, that's, I'm not saying something new, is go, trying to figure out how we can make those states, make what we want and what something is readable by both humans and machines. And this is important part for later, right? Remember, the state needs to be readable both by you, human, male, female, boy, girl, and by machines at the same time. If one of those two cannot read the state, we're in trouble. Simply because if you cannot find out what something should be, then... How do you review that something? How do you know that's what you really want? And if machines cannot read it, then we have a problem that we cannot have processes that will create the actual state, create something out of what we want. So when I talk about declarative, and by the way, this being readable by humans and machines, that's declarative state of something, right? I'm not very happy about an imperative declaration of the states, but we'll get to that later. And when you say declarative, any declarative format is fine. You can use JSON. If you really don't like yourself, you can use YAML, which is easier to read, easier to write. You can use HCL, like in Terraform, and so on and so forth, right? doesn't matter. There are many formats as long as they're declarative, right? Now, you can say, hey, how about writing that something in Python, Go, Java, JavaScript? That's a bad idea. I know that many people like tools, that allow you to specify what you want in programming languages, but it's a bad idea. And the reason why it's a bad idea, first of all, because programming languages themselves, Go, like Python, are very bad for you as a human to deduce what you want, right? Because going through some Go code to find out, oh, yeah, you want a database, is actually much, much harder than deducing that something from declarative syntax. Now, programming languages are amazing. Every single devil of something, every single person working in software industry needs to know how to write code. But writing code is for applications themselves, 
and it is also for writing the declarative specs, which I'll get to that later, right? Now, that was 25 years ago. In the meantime, we got tools that enable us to do just that. Now, let me double check chat whether there is any comment. No comments? And no comments in chat? No. Let me see. Oh, there is a Q&A. Since CF has so many tools, now we have a list of them, Terraform, Pulumi, Grot, and set different companies with different infrastructure tools. It's difficult to clear their interviews and also learn all of them together. Please suggest. Okay, suggestion which tool to use in the, among those that you name will come at the end of this talk. And I will explain why also it will come. So I will answer that question just a bit later because that's really the point of this talk. But keep coming with questions. I will try to answer them all. Anyways, going back to declarative infrastructure, right? And when I say declarative, we got Pulumi. Sorry, oh no, Pulumi came much later. CF Engine, long, long time ago. Then we got South Stock, Stock, and Ansible. Later on, we transitioned into Terraform, Pulumi, and so forth. Now, the way how declarative state looks like, let me show you one example here. Here we go. Cut main right. This is Terraform, for example, syntax, which is very easy to understand and read and also easy for machines to interpret and do something with it. Like in this case, I'm saying, hey, I want to have, I'm not saying create because I do not know whether it should be created or updated or something should be done. I do not care what is, which operation should be done with it. What I do care is that I want an EKS cluster. It has some parameters like this is the name, this is the role ARM, this is VPC config. It depends on some other things. Then I want EKS node group and I specify what I want either directly by car coding some values or referencing some other fields from some other resources or providing them as values and so on and so forth. Relatively easy, relatively straightforward. In this case, it's HCL, which is HashiCorp proprietary language, but it can be something else. Now, the good thing about that, what you just saw on the screen, is that, first of all, it is more or less declarative, right? I'm intentionally saying more or less because in all those tools, you can put a bit of some loops, you can put some conditionals, you can put some other things that will make it hard to deduce what it is when you read it, but it's mostly declarative, if not fully, so that's okay. And both machines and humans, my very important requirement, both of them can understand what's going on, read it, and so on and so forth, right? So this is absolutely amazing. And you would get the same thing if I output something from defined in a simple format or CF engine again, and so on and so forth, right? Now, if I would like to do drip detection, I could do something like this. Let's say that I want to have a cluster with four nodes. Right. I execute a command and I have specified everything about that cluster and the networking and so on and so forth. And I just changed the number of nodes in that cluster to be four. And you can see here, it went through my AWS account. It found out all the different things that I have specified here. And I have quite a few, right? And it came up to me and saying, okay, so if this is what you want, this is what I need to do. I do not need to touch route tables. I do not need to do anything about security groups and so on and so forth. But I will have to modify this primary node group and change it. I change a couple of parameters like desired state. Desired size is going to become four and the minimum size is going to become four as well, right? So it tells me these are the things that I will have to change to fulfill your desires. Are you okay with that? And then I can type yes or no, or I could have applied this without even having the prompt and just without being asked any questions. So this is great. This is a, that's the drift detection. That's the tool or the process detecting what's the difference between what I want and what I have, right? Suggesting the changes and asking me to apply those changes. Now, there are a couple of things missing from here, from this approach. And again, everything I'm saying now for Terraform equally applies to almost all other tools. So I'm using it as an example, not because I'm advocating or crushing Terraform in this case. There are a couple of extremely important things missing. And when I say missing, I mean missing based on our understanding of how those things should be done today, not necessarily missing from five years ago. Five years ago, we had a different idea of what is good, our perception, our requirements, our needs are changing with time. 
So what is missing? First of all, the actual state. Now I can do something like this. I can say Terraform, show me everything that is that I have right now in this project. And I get all the information. This is everything that, that I have defined in this project. But this is silly looking at it from today's perspective, because there are quite a few downsides. One of them is that I cannot query. There is no API behind Terraform or any other similar tool. I cannot say, hey, give me what's the state of everything I have in my AWS account. I can always say, give me the state of this specific project. I cannot filter things. I cannot say, I'm not really interested in this. I'd like to see only what is happening with my subnets or VPCs. I'm only interested, I cannot query things. I cannot, there is no API. And no, no person today would start from scratch today designing a tool without having an API. Because APIs are how we operate today. They were not considered that important in the past but they are considered important now. And without an API, it is close to impossible for us to deduce what something is. The next thing missing is the continuous drip detection. Now, I already showed you when I said the telephone will apply, so it shows me the drift, but it shows me the drift only when I ask for it. So it has drift detection. It doesn't have continuous drift detection. What I mean by that, so many of you are probably using Kubernetes in one form or another, at least containers, right? And when you use Kubernetes, you have continuous drift detection, meaning that there is a process that is continuously watching for the changes between what the state of what I want, what we want, and what something is. It's a continuous process that is constantly checking the differences between the states. Because if I said I want X all the time, right? It's not that I want to have something only when I say that I want it. It's a kind of infinite contract until I change my mind, I want to have this, no matter what happens, no matter whether the data center goes down, no matter whether some malicious user did something and so on and so forth. We do not have that with the tools that are currently dominant, right? And we don't have the continuous reconciliation, which is just as important or more, meaning that I do not want you to continuously monitor the state of my resources. I want you to continuously reconcile that state. Just as way, if you deploy something in Kubernetes, let's say an application through a deployment that creates pods and a pod goes down, what happens? There is a process that will bring it back up because you said you want three pods. Now there are two. I'm not waiting for you to tell me, fix it. I'm going to fix it for you the moment it happens. The moment there is a drift, I'm going to reconcile those two states. That's a common thing today that we did not have in the past. And there is also a problem of discovery. Now, I can say something like cut variables, for example, and say, oh, this is these are all the things that I can define for creating a cluster, whatever I have in this. Oh, the, I can specify a region. I can specify the name of the cluster. I can specify minimum number of points. This is okay, because as long as I know where is that file with some values, I can find it and I can see what it is and I can modify it. But again, going back to the APIs, what you really want is to have a discoverable schema, meaning that I want to go to the API and say, hey, I would like to work with this something, with the RDS or with EC2 or with this or that. Give me, give me the information about that thing. I do not really want to go through 57 different repositories to find some file that does something. Now, where was I? And there is one more thing, extremely important thing today that is missing from what we said before, and that's shift left. What do I mean by shift left? You're an expert in something. Let's say that you're an expert in databases, right? And then traditionally, somebody else who needs a database, who is not an expert in that database or whatever that something is, would open a general ticket and then you would receive the ticket. And whenever you have time, if you're free at one moment in the future, you would do it for them, right? We do not do that anymore. Shift left means that we are trying to shift those operations that are happening on the right side to the left towards developers. And to do that, we need to have a mechanism how to create abstraction layers that are simple enough that fit their needs at the same time and that can be consumed by anybody, no matter the level of experience that they have, right? It's about codifying somebody's expertise 
into a service. So what we need today, what we were missing in the past is continuous drift detection and reconciliation, extremely important feature. We know it from Kubernetes, for example. We need API for discovery of what something is, and we need extensions to be able to extend those APIs to create something that is tailor-made for our needs and yet consumable by anybody within our company, right? Those are the three requirements that we are missing, at least from my perspective. Now, that's why we are moving now into something that we typically call control planes. Before I continue, let me check your questions in the chat if there is anything else. Not here, Q&A, okay. Can you really please provide the Terraform script? Yes, I can. I will do that right away. I will not provide the Terraform script, but I will provide the link to the slides that among other things contains the Terraform script and everything else you're seeing here. So here's, a, I posted it as the answer to that question. And another question, how does Terraform differ from other infrastructure as code tools? It doesn't really, it's doing more or less the same as other infrastructures code tools. So the tools that we call infrastructure as code. What I'm going to show you now is a next generation that we call control planes. So if you look at it from the perspective, historical perspective, we had nothing like scripts. Then we got configuration management tools or tools that are commonly called configuration management, which would be something like Ansible and Saltstack and then CF Engine. Then we got the next generation of tool, call it second generation, which would be infrastructure as code, like Terraform, Pulumi, and so forth. And now we're going into, let's say, third generation, which is control planes, mostly inspired by the lessons learned from running applications in Kubernetes and now extending that experience into everything else. Keep up with the questions. I like this so much better than me just talking to an empty space. So control planes. Actually, anybody who ever used any cloud service or Kubernetes or many other services used control planes without knowing that you're using control planes, right? And you communicate directly or indirectly with AWS API, with their API, with Google API, and so on and so forth. There is a control plane behind the scenes. You just don't see it, right? Similarly, if you use Kubernetes, you're having effectively a control plane, but by default or out of the box, or for most people, limited to applications, packages, container images. Now we're going further than that. We're creating, we're extending the concept of control planes in two different directions. First of all, in the direction that you can set it up yourself instead of just relying 100% on control planes that you don't see that are working behind the scenes like the AWS or Azure or Google. Second, extending it way beyond containers. And that extension widely accepted, nobody discusses it anymore, but it's already one way or another based on Kubernetes. So let me show you how that looks like. Let's say that I'm going to go to this directory and I'm going to execute this command. I will show you in a second what that command does, but while it's running. So I'm just telling Kubernetes in this case, hey, apply this something defined in this file. Now, what this file is what really matters. Now I'm 100% fully Kubernetes, right? Not doing anything else. What I'm doing here is what I just applied is saying, hey, how about you manage something that is called an instance? And that instance you can judge by the API version is something is EC2 instance in AWS. And how about you and Kubernetes? Not this is not directly related now with AWS in any form or way. How about you create a VPC and how about you create a subnet? Or maybe not create, maybe update, maybe delete. I do not know. But I want to have those three things, right? So I'm instructing my Kubernetes cluster with all the good things we already know and love about Kubernetes to create three resources called subnet and VPC and instance, right? And from now on, this is now following the same process as you would apply or get if you created the deployment in Kubernetes, right? The only difference is that Kubernetes out of the box comes with a couple of predefined resource definitions, which nobody should ever use, but that would be a separate discussion unless you ask me in comments, right? And then you tailor made, you extend Kubernetes to manage whatever you wanted to manage. And in this case, I'm saying, I want to extend Kubernetes 
to manage AWS, in this specific case, the, those three resources. So this is still declarative, right? This is as declarative as you can get. So no change there. I'm not telling you to change anything. And this is also something that both humans, you can read. It's very easy. And this is something that can be interpreted by machines, by processes. In this case, standard Kubernetes API. Nothing really special happening here. Now, let's take a look at the drift, drift detection and reconciliation. If I go now to, let's say I'm going to open my AWS account and let's see what's happening there. I'm improvising a bit here. There we go. I have my C2 instances. Let's see. There we go. I have four running. Three of them doesn't matter, but this is the one. You see this one over here? That's the one that was created by my Kubernetes cluster acting as a control plane. It is still initializing. It is not yet finished. And from now on, Kubernetes is managing. And we have, as I said, drift detection and reconciliation. What that means is that if I shut down this VM, I will terminate it, shut it down. I'm simulating something bad happening to it. And then if I refresh, you see it's gone. There is no, it's gone, right? Now, if there is no trip detection reconciliation or if they're not continuous, this is it. My VM is gone forever and ever. There's nothing I can do to bring it back except me as a human getting out of my bed in 3 o'clock in the morning and executing some command that will create it again and so forth. But what will happen, and I will be, get back to this later, I don't want you to wait for too long. Soon, my Kubernetes cluster will discover that there is a drift. You said you want a VM. There is no VM because somebody, something happened to it. I don't know what, I do not know what happened. I do not care. What I do know is that it's gone and you said that you want it and it will create it again. I'll get back to this screen later. Trust me, for now, it will create it. Now, I already mentioned that discovery is something that is a problem or problem that we had in the past, right? Now, if you're using Kubernetes, that's not a problem at all because, again, it has an API. It allows you to discover all the things you can do with it, right? Based on your permissions and so on and so forth. So I can say, hey, let me see what I can do here. What are, the, what are all the things that I can do? And, oh, that's a typo here. Let's see this. And this is the response from my cluster. And this will differ from one place to another, right? It says, oh, you have something called load balancers. You can create load balancers. There is something called, I don't know, VPC links. You can manage those as well, right? You have a discoverable API that allows you to discover what are all the things that you can and you cannot do. You cannot do anything in Kubernetes, but those are all the things that you can tell me that you want, and I will do something to make it happen. And similarly, if you don't know how to define that something, you can say, hey, explain to me, let me show you the command again, explain to me how I can define something called instance, for example, right? And you get the full schema of that something with all the fields, you know exactly what you need to do. You do not even need to Google the documentation, right? Those are the statuses. You do not care for them, but this is the spec that allows you to define all the things that you might or might not need, right? So discoverable API. Now, let me go back now to the shift lab. Now, I showed you how to create something very simple, VM. And by the way, let me see. Is the VM up and running again? Hey, there we go. See? Where that guy was missing, it's back there. I did not lie yet. <laughs> okay, let me go back to Shift Lab. Creating VM is easy. All you have to do is create a VM. Anybody can do that, right? But let's say something as complicated as a Kubernetes cluster, right? To create a Kubernetes cluster in AWS, I'm using an example, is something actually that not everybody can do. And the reason why not everybody can do is because to create a Kubernetes cluster in AWS, you need to define EKS cluster, you need to create, to define one or more node groups, you need to define VPCs, subnets, internet gateways, you need to define, what else? A bunch of things, I think 20, 30 resources are required to make this thing running, right? Nobody knows how to do that except people who are specialized in AWS. And then we go back to my initial conversation. That means that either you open a general ticket and then wait, nobody knows how long, or 
that somebody who knows how to do that can provide it to you as a service. Now, service, if it's easy, if it fulfills your needs, it enables you to be autonomous. It enables you to do stuff without waiting for that somebody, for that guru, somebody sitting in a basement, right? So let me show you an example. I'm going to execute it first, and then I'm going to show you what I executed. So I'm just going to tell Kubernetes, hey, I want something defined in this file, which is something called cluster claim, right? Now, cluster claim, this does not come out of the box. You cannot get this thing you call cluster claim, no matter what you install in your cluster. This is something I made myself, right? I define for my organization what it means to create a cluster and how that can be easy. And I will show you the definition of that something. Uh, here we go. Imagine that I spoke with everybody in my company, with developers and what's not, and said, okay, you want to manage Kubernetes clusters yourself? You don't want me, you don't need me, you want me to be fired, not to be indispensable anymore in my company? Excellent. This is how you're going to do that. First of all, you're going to tell me, what do you care about, right? You don't, do you care about subnets? Nobody cares about subnets, right? Do you care about VPCs? No. What do you care about? And imagine that in that hypothetical situation, they told me, hey, I want to be able to specify the size of the servers in my cluster. Excellent. And then the follow-up question would be, do you know what are all the available sizes in AWS, Azure, or Google? And imagine that in that hypothetical conversation, they said, no, I have no idea. It's T2 something or T3 something something in AWS. Cool. I'm going to allow you to say small, medium, large. And I'll figure out what small, medium, large means in AWS, right? I know that stuff you don't, that's okay. So you can specify the size to be small, medium, large. In this case, medium. And I'm, and what else do you need? Oh, I want to specify how many nodes I have in a cluster at the, at the beginning, right? Because it will grow automatically, auto resize, stuff like that. Okay, I'm going to allow you to do that as well. And I'm going to create a system that will write the connection string, kubeconfig, to a secret and so that you can get it yourself and use the cluster. It's your stuff. I don't care about it. It's, it will be yours, right? Not mine anymore. Anyways, so I created a new custom resource definition, Kubernetes called cluster claim. I'm using Crossplane for that, but you can do this with other tools. I allow people to specify where they want their cluster, AWS or EKS or Azure. It could be Azure or it could be Google, right? And a few parameters, and that's about it. And I already executed that. My Kubernetes cluster is already creating it, and I can show you the result of that. Look at this. This is now, and imagine that this could be a web UI. So if you like pretty colors, if you freak out when you see terminals, that's okay. You could get the same information through some web UI if that's if terminals are not here. Right? What does matter here is that this is very easy for everybody. Everybody, for the vast majority of people in my organization, they just need to care about, hey, I said that I want to claim a cluster. This is the information I'm getting. You can see the things that matter to you, like control plane is being created right now. It is not yet ready. It will take some time. It takes 20 minutes in AWS and so on and so forth, right? Easy. Now, if you want to know more, right? Now imagine that I'm changing the head. I'm not a developer anymore. I'm an ops person. I want to know what did that guy create, right? What happened? Which level of madness he, did he put me in? Oh, that simple definition. And let me output it again. This thing, those 10 lines of YAML created this, managed. And this is important because these are now low-level details that majority of people do not care, but some do. That's different abstraction layers. This is what you care about, and this is what I care about, right? Now, this will take a minute or two to until it executes, and I'll get back to that. Almost there. Almost there. Okay, there we go. That single YAML created this. This is what all the things, security groups, internet gateways, VPCs, subnets, route tables, and so on and so forth. Those are all the things that somebody needs to care about to create a production ready cluster that I just simplified for them. They are my customers, they are my users. They have a very easy way to manage their clusters and I do not need to read and wake up in the morning through Jira tickets. Now let me see the questions. From Nikhil, is it a good practice to use Kubernetes for infra provisioning? Yes, yes, it is a good practice. Simply because Kubernetes is the standard. Kubernetes is the standard API, widely accepted by everybody, right? Nobody, if you asked me this question five years ago, I would start debating with you, hey, should it be Kubernetes? Should it be Mesos? Should it be Docker? So there are no debates anymore. 
everybody standardized on Kubernetes. That means that Kubernetes is alpha and omega of everything, even of the things that are not running in Kubernetes, right? Yeah, I'm using Kubernetes as a control plane to manage resources, some of them running in that same cluster, some of them running somewhere else, a database, RDS, doesn't matter what it is. And so, yes, it is a good practice to use Kubernetes to provision anything. Doesn't matter whether it is to manage anything. Doesn't matter whether that's containers running in Kubernetes cluster, whether that's resources in AWS, whether that's something in Azure, whether that's GitHub repositories or anything else. Kubernetes is the de facto standard for an extensible API that you can fine tune to do whatever you want it to do for you. So yes, big yes. Okay, this is exciting. Now, let me see, what else? Now, apart from other things, one amazing thing about Kubernetes is that it plugs into almost whole CNCF ecosystem. CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Foundation, is the place where basically vast majority, almost all innovation happening in the world today is in that foundation one way or another, right? Not all, vast majority. And the important thing, the thing that did not exist before is that almost all the tools, almost all the projects in this ecosystem, again, which is the biggest ecosystem ever seen in this industry, works together, right? That means that you do not need to look for specialist tools and say, hey, how do I get logs from my Terraform something? How do I get metrics from my Ansible something? Within the Kubernetes ecosystem, everything works together because they are all plugging in to the same platform, meaning what I showed you now was cross-plan composition specifically, and there is no way to retrieve logs from cross-plane. There is no way to get metrics observability, and that's by design because you can combine it with any other tools that you're already using in your Kubernetes cluster and just extend it. What else do I have here? Yeah, so what you've seen so far is cross-plane. And this is now the reason why I didn't answer. I might be butchering your names. I don't know whether I'm pronouncing your names right, but you asked at the very beginning, uh, CNCF has so many tools. Now we have a list of them to reform, Pulumi, Crossplane, et cetera. Please suggest. I suggest, I will not suggest Crossplane because I'm biased. What I will suggest is to use Kubernetes to manage your resources. Now, whether you're using Crossplane or you're using KubeVirt or you're using Cluster API, or Google Cloud Connect, or so on and so forth, right? There are many choices. I work with Crossplane, I'm biased. I would say Crossplane, but what I'm going to say is not Crossplane. I'm going to say use Kubernetes to manage resources of any kind, whether that's Crossplane, or Cluster API, or something else is a separate question. Do not go back in time, right? We had great tools. Their time is over. We have a new set of logic and tools and processes, and they will be replaced. Kubernetes will be replaced in the future with something else. But that day is not today. And from Philip, there is a question. How can I find all the API version to provision AWS services with YAML like yours? Here, let me do it again. Kubectl, get CRDs, and let's say that you want only those related to AWS. There we go. That's how you find them. And I have a small subset of CRDs. Actually, if you install AWS official provider, not the one I use here, you will get approximately eight to 900 CRDs. There's a custom resource, the Kubernetes custom resource definitions. There are some resources in AWS. So if I install this official provider, you will get around seven or 800 CRDs here. And then you use any tool like Lens or any other Kubernetes tool to see what they are and how to use them. Okay, so let me see what else I can prepare. You're also crowded questions. I do not have anything else prepared, but I do have 15 minutes for your questions. And while you're typing your questions, I work for Abound. We are a company, we are a team behind Crossplane. It's open source. I'm not selling you anything. It's in CNCF. It's donated to CNCF project. I have a podcast, which you might want to listen if you have nothing better to do in your life. And I have a YouTube channel that you might want to watch some things. And now we have 15 minutes for questions. Are you planning to have any books tutorial on Crossplane? Not in the near future. I gave up. I published nine books so far or something like that. 
I'm not doing books anymore for a reason that I'm very interested in cutting edge technology, right? I want to be as close to the edge as possible, try to predict the future. And the books I was publishing before, by the time I finished them, which is approximately one year later, it takes around, it took me at least around one year to finish a book. By the time I finish the book and I'm about to click the publish button on Amazon, I go through it and no, this is silly. I don't believe that this is a good thing anymore. It's been a year, right? I prefer shorter term content in YouTube mostly. I do also a lot of events and also it's free. I don't have a goal to earn money. So I prefer YouTube because it's free and it's more accessible and all those things. Now we have from Nikhil, why Terraform is so popular for infer provisioning and Ansible for config management. So I think that Coffee management and infra provisioning are the same thing. It's just different approaches to things to begin with. Normally, the tools that we call today config management were tools based on something we call promise theory, meaning that they assume bare metal servers. You know, many people are not using it for bare metal servers. And the whole idea behind coffee management tools is that everything is mutable, meaning that you have something and then you change that something and then you change it again and change the, this and change that, right? Now, when Terraform came and the tools that we today call infrastructure as code, they're mostly based, mostly, not fully, on the ideas of immutable everything. Meaning that if you wanted to change your VM, you do not change a VM. You create a new VM based on new different specification. So we replace things. We do not change things. That's also the same logic containers are based on. Now, going back to your question, why Terraform is so popular for infra provisioning is because Terraform is the first, one of the first tools that came behind that idea, right? Just as Crossplane is one of the first tools that came with the idea of control planes instead of infrastructure as code, which replaced config management. So config management, infrastructure is called control planes. Now, whether Crossplane will be that popular as Terraform, that's yet to be seen. I claim I know the future, but I don't. And uh, Nitin has the answer to Nikhil. Those are high level things about Terraform. Is it an ACL language? Yes. Just as YAML is also very easy, open source. Yes. And multi-cloud. Yes. Good answer. So what else? How to walk through all those complexities? How to walk through all those complexities with a sane mind? Any suggestions how you did it? Now, first of all, you assume that I have a sane mind. I probably don't. So kind of, I have nothing to lose. I cannot become insane if I'm already insane. So that works in my favor. You can't. And it's not the job of one person in a company to know everything, right? We are all specialized in something, right? Somebody knows Java and JVM inside out, somebody special, somebody is very good at databases, somebody else is very good at networking and so forth. Things are complex. Actually, things are easier than they ever were. It was never easier than it is today to do the things, pay attention to what I'm saying, that we were doing in the past. So it's easier to do things today than it was before if we would be doing the same things. However, requirements changed, right? Before, most companies had a couple of servers. Now, most companies have hundreds of servers. Before, we were delivering things a couple of times a year. Now, we deliver things every day or multiple times a day, right? So, things are complex because our needs are more complex than they were before, not because technology itself is more complex. Uh, but yeah, short answer to your question, I don't have a sane mind, so I don't know what sane people do. What else? This is fun. Is there labs in GitHub to get some hands on with Crossplane? I have quite a few videos about Crossplane in my channel, which is this one that you see on the screen right now. And every video I make, not in the beginning, long, long time ago, I didn't do that. But for now, every video I make has a link to the gist in the description so you can reproduce everything I do. Every single video, tutorial, review, anything I do in YouTube has a gist with all the commands. You can reproduce everything I do. So that's hands-on, right? I do 
almost everything hands on, and I always create instructions for everybody to reproduce what I'm doing. Then there is also official documentation for crosspoint.io and probably many other resources. Should I be using only Kubernetes as you suggest for all my infra provisioning and management in the cloud instead of Terraform, CloudFormation, Ansible, etc.? Yes, you should be using Kubernetes. No, so if you already have everything working, right? If you already have Terraform and you're happy with it, and being happy with Terraform means that you don't run at scale, you have no problem with state and so on, it so doesn't matter. If you already have everything set up, Use it. I'm not saying don't. But if you're starting something new today, it would be silly to invest time, money, effort into something that is not Kubernetes. Because Kubernetes is the only sure bet we have now of something that will exist in not so distant future. So for new stuff or improvements, use Kubernetes. I'm not saying to get rid of everything. Most companies still run mainframe. But yes, this is the present and the future, the short-term future. Future, long-term future, nobody knows. Oh, you're so talkative. I love this setting. This is amazing. I really get so much questions. Thank you so much for joining this session. See you next time. Come to the YouTube channel. That's where I post everything I do. Everything I do is public. So no hidden anything. I'm working with serverless architecture. Any suggestion? Yes, serverless. First of all, some people interpret it one way or another. I want to make clear that serverless architecture does not mean that you're only and exclusively working with functions as a service. There are many different variations of serverless, like Google Cloud Run, my favorite, is containers as a service, flavor of serverless. Anyways, if you use serverless, that's great. Le one less thing to worry. You still need to manage it somehow. And I would still suggest Kubernetes, uh, no matter whether your serverless is Google Cloud Run or Lambda or this or that, you still need to manage it somehow, but that management is much easier than if you don't use serverless. So big fan of serverless. Not such a big fan, and we can have a fight over that, of functions as a service. I think that there are very narrow and small number of use cases where functions as a service is a good flavor of serverless. But containers as a service, flavor of serverless, is, I love it absolutely. I think it's amazing. Is this solution ready for enterprise? How to talk with security people? So two questions. Is this solution ready for enterprise? I'm assuming that you're talking. So that can mean two things. Is Kubernetes ready for enterprise? Of course it is. There is no doubt about that anymore. If the question is whether Crossplane is ready for enterprise, it all depends what you mean ready for enterprise. I've been working with enterprises that say nothing that hasn't been used by millions of people for 30 years is ready for us. That's why we still use mainframe. It's not ready for that type of enterprise, but I cannot tell you the names of the companies because of NDAs that have signed and stuff like that. What I can tell you is that right now, at least 50% of Fortune 100 companies are, I cannot say using, because that takes a bit of more time, but evaluating and POCing and using in some capacity or another Kubernetes to manage stuff outside of containers including crossplane. And there is how to talk with security people. There is no, Kubernetes is a holy grail of security tools. Kubernetes and security tools, like security people drool about around Kubernetes when using security tools because it's so advanced and stuff like that. So yes, security Kubernetes is, we have great tooling, very advanced, really. And Mohammed, thank you, I'm a fan of your YouTube channel. Well, thank you for being a fan. Please Keep your good work and also thanks Code Cloud to arrange this webinar. Yes, thank you, Code Cloud, for doing this. Which is the highest paying technical role currently and which role interests you the most? Please describe what you would like to do if you work in a big tech company. I personally, and I'm not saying that there is anything wrong with it, but I don't like working in big tech companies because big tech companies tend to put some manager on top of me and then all of a sudden I need to be managed by somebody. I cannot be managed. That's my problem. I'm unmanageable, so I tend to stay in smaller companies myself. I don't like st structure, I like chaos, and I create chaos for everybody else working with me. There's nothing wrong working in a big tech company, but not for me. And which role interests you the most? The role that nobody knows what it is in a company so that nobody can manage me. If you ask my colleagues in Upbound, most of them don't know what they do, and I like to keep it that way, right? <laughs> then I have no deadlines, I have no objectives and any of those things. So the role is a secret.
because even I don't know what my role is. Thank you, everybody. This was fun. Thank you, everybody, for joining. See you next time.